My name's Jeff Bajoric, and my career in sales has been a hell of a ride. And I want to bring you along with me. If you prefer to sell things at a premium, if you never want to win a deal on price, rethink the way you sell. Welcome back to the show. My name is Jeff Bajoric. I'm your host, and I'm here to help you rethink the way you sell. Um, I think there's a lack of perspective in the sales profession, uh, particularly around what success and failure mean. And look, selling is a results-oriented game. You made the sale or you didn't. You won or you lost. I get it. And that clarity, that black and white nature of did you win the deal, yes or no? Did you hit your number, yes or no? I think there's a tremendous amount of value to that. And in, in a lot of ways, it's like golf. Golf is a results-oriented game. It, there are no pictures on the scorecard, as they say. Did you make par or did you make better or did you make an X? And you golfers out there will know what I mean by that. But th I think it's important to have some perspective here for what it takes to succeed, ultimately, you know, I mean, along those lines of black and white, did you or didn't you? Well, what about all the little steps along the way? You know, one of the biggest mistakes that salespeople make is having this conception that they need to say the perfect thing at the perfect time to the perfect person in the perfect way in order to make a sale, to try to catch lightning in a bottle. And I find this particularly with people in professional services and clients of mine that I work with. I go on sales calls with these people and we'll get ready to walk into an office and know we're going to see a gatekeeper. And they are so concerned about how to get through the gatekeeper, how to talk to the CEO or the president or whatever VP decision maker that they need to get in front of. And it's like, hold on a second. We're going to need to talk to this receptionist. We're going to need to learn who the right people are. We're going to need to learn how to get a hold of them. We're going to need to do a lot of things along the way. If you have your expectations set at such a level that they are literally unattainable on that first call, everything is going to feel like failure. Everything is going to feel like a rejection. Everything is going to feel demoralizing around and about this process. And let's talk about how unrealistic that is. So what's funny is, is we get in the car, we drive from place to place and I say, okay, what is it we want to accomplish here? We want to introduce ourselves. We want to understand who we should be talking to. We want to hopefully get some contact information and a way to set an appointment with those people. Can we do that? Oh yeah, that should be, that should be pretty simple. You're right. It is pretty simple. And then as soon as we establish a reasonable goal for that first interaction, maybe it's a second, fourth, eighth interaction. These, these processes are all different lengths. Their, their shoulders immediately drop. Their blood pressure calms down and, and it's amazing. And now what does that sound like? Well, it sounds like you're in position to do your best work instead of being so anxious about getting everything perfect. That different, that additional perspective is huge, it makes all the difference in the world. And so what I want to help you do today is redefine what success and failure look like. I want to just give you a couple of minutes and I want to give you some permission to think about your sales calls differently. That different perspective is going to help you extend some of your uh, sales cycles. It's going to help you extend some of your uh, relationships and your follow-ups. It's going to keep the ball in the air longer, which is what you need to do sometimes in order to make the sale. So what does it mean to sell like you? Well, in short, it means more pipeline. It means bigger deals that close faster and more often. It means more customer loyalty, so there's less churn. And it means a culture on your team where winning is expected and everyone's having fun. Now, if this sounds like something your team needs, go to jeffbajorek.com forward slash services and find out how I use this approach to help teams like yours create world-class results. Now, back to the show. So I define success on a sales call as learning something that will help me make the next sales call. 
And I, I talked about this with Harriet last week about how one time I went up north in Michigan. I forgot what day it was. It was a beautiful day. I had no understanding or comprehension of why <laughs> all of these businesses were closed, except I didn't realize that it was November 15th. It's an unofficial holiday for most of the northern half of this state because that's the, um, that's the opening of deer hunting season, rifle season. I'm not a hunter, so that's not a red letter day on my calendar, so to speak. Um, but it is for a lot of people. They close the schools. Everybody goes into their deer stands and they, it's, it's a celebration. I wasn't paying attention, so I didn't know that. So that day could have easily been chalked up as a failure. Jeff, how could you have not paid attention? Why didn't you plan ahead? Why didn't you this, this? You know what? I learned a valuable lesson. I learned a valuable lesson to pay attention to something in the future that I didn't that day. I learned to laugh at myself a little bit. I learned that this was a story I'd be able to tell later. I learned that I would be able to use this interaction with those prospects as I eventually made contact with them and could inject a little bit of levity and a little bit of humor into my introduction, into our relationship. All of that stuff is incredibly positive. But if I would have been stuck in the, oh, what a waste of a day. You drove a couple hours one way. You wasted all these calls. All of this could have been prevented and avoided. No, it's not a failure. I learned something. You're going to make cold calls sometimes, and you are going to be what feels like rejection. And we'll get into redefining rejection on another call, on another uh, podcast episode, rather. But you're going to feel like you're getting so many things wrong. Are those reps helping you to refine your approach? Are those reps helping you to get better at what you do? Are you, are you, are you honing your craft along the way? And look, I understand that this can be a little bit, this can be mis perceived as, uh, well, Bajoric's just looking at everything through rose-colored glasses. I can turn anything into a win. Um, it's not just rose-colored glasses. This is what needs to happen in order for you to keep your mindset and your swagger in a good enough place to keep doing what we all know is very difficult to do. So you have to look for those silver linings. You have to look for those threads of victory and success. So I consider a failure, I consider a sales call to be a failure when I fail to learn something, when I fail to get a little bit better on that call in some way, shape or form, um, that's, my, that's my bar for success or failure. And so what that leads me to do is that in a call that doesn't go the way I want it to, oh, I find a win. I ask an extra question or two. I find another thread to pull on so that I can make a victory out of this defeat. And when you do that, that's, again, I'll mention keeping the ball in the air long enough for you to eventually catch it. And I'm not talking about unnecessarily extending sales cycles. Look, it's hard enough and long enough to close sales. We don't need to make it take any longer than it needs to take. But I think too many salespeople give up on these processes well before they should. They give up on these opportunities before they're even given an opportunity to come to fruition. So when you look for the small wins and when you look for ways to find a small win in every interaction, you find that you're taking these little steps forward, not just with these prospects or clients. They don't always come to fruition. Sometimes they find you, you find out they're going to be dead ends. Sometimes they just don't work out. But each one of these little victories is another small step. And no step is too small so long as it's headed in the right direction and you keep taking steps. So this is why I continue to follow up with people who haven't called me back. This is why when I know I can help somebody, I persist longer than more people do. I keep them in my CRM longer than most people will keep them there. I work opportunities until... I get definite answers. And that's why I say that I believe that more salespeople ghost their prospects than the other way around, because most salespeople just end up giving up way too early. Oh, this is a dead end. 
this is never going to happen. You know, when, when you say those things, that is a lack of belief. And if you've been paying any attention to what I've been doing over the last several months, let alone what I've been doing over the last several years, you understand that that lack of belief is what will kill that sale. It's not the customer's lack of wanting to call you back. It's your lack of belief that you're worth being called back. You got to consider these things. So on the surface, is this redefinition of success and failure? Is this just, uh, is this just a, a device to help you keep your wits about you and keep moving forward? Sure. At the very least, it's that. But when you dig a little bit deeper, this is actually the mechanism that helps you make more sales. It doesn't just keep you in the process long enough for them to call you back. It keeps you digging, scratching, clawing for any little step forward that will start to feel like progress. And when that progress picks up momentum, that snowball starts rolling downhill. It gets bigger. It gets more inertia. It gains more momentum. It is harder to stop. That's the point here. When you can appropriately define what success and failure look like, you will stay in more deals. You will stay in them longer. You will build longer, more sustainable relationships. You will make more sales. And most importantly, you will make sales perpetually and with regularity, not have this up and down roller coaster ride at the end of the month or the quarter where, well, I need this deal, so I got a discount, and I know I'm going to borrow from next month's pipeline to win today, but uh, that's just the way we do it around here. It doesn't have to be the way you do it. This is exactly how I went from just a meddling rep hoping to hit their number on a monthly basis to knowing I was not going to miss a quarter. And I didn't miss many months in the meantime either. Consider this stuff. The way you think about what you do has an indelible impact on how you do it and how well you do it. Uh, speaking of someone who does something really, really well, next week I have Ravi Rajani on and his conversation or my conversation with him, his conversation with me, <laughs> however you want to define that, about storytelling is one I cannot wait for you to hear. I recorded it a couple of months ago. This was the place where his interview fit the best. It is so good. Made me rethink the way I tell stories, made me rethink uh, the way I think about storytelling and uh, opened up a new world for me. I know it's going to do the same for you. Thank you for being with me here today. I can't wait to talk to you again next week. Let's do it. Rethink the Way You Sell is a Pot About It production. It's mixed and edited by Doug Branson with music by Blue Dot Sessions and Doug Branson. This podcast is masterminded by Jeff Bajorek.